Good morning. It's a complete, yeah, I love it. Good morning. Let's get the That's lovely. What a wonderful way to start the day, right? Um, it is a complete honor to be here with you today. Uh, I've actually wanted to attend EDU for many years and haven't been able to, so this just makes me so happy to be here. Um, I decided for this talk I'd pr put together a whole new talk for you, which is both a delight and a terror, so you'll have to be patient with me. Apparently at least one of you heard me practicing it in my hotel room last night, um, which I also find delightful and entertaining and also a little scary. Um, my talk today is meant to be a little provocative, so you'll have to tell me how it goes. Growing up, I took certain truths to be self-evident. Democracy is good, war is bad, and of course, all men are created equal. My mother was a teacher who encouraged me to question everything. But I quickly learned that some questions were taboo. Is democracy inherently good? Is the military ethical? Does God exist? I loved pushing people's buttons with these philosophical questions but they weren't nearly as existentially destabilizing as the moments in my life in which experiences didn't line up with frames that were sacred cows in my community. Police were revered, and so when I was battling a cop who was regularly taking food from where I worked at Subway, and my boss didn't believe me, I didn't understand how to even respect the police. Pastors were moral authorities, and so I didn't know how to contend with the fact that my pastor was engaged in an affair, and no one wanted to talk about it. Forgiveness is a beautiful thing, but hypocrisy is destabilizing. Nothing can radicalize someone more than feeling like you're being lied to, or that the world that you've adopted has come, somehow come crumbling down. The funny thing about education is that we ask our students to challenge their assumptions, and that process can be enlightening and destabilizing. I will never forget reading the People's History of the United States. The idea that there could be multiple histories, multiple truths, blew my mind. But the hole that opened up, that invites people to look for new ways of seeing without an explanation to fill it, that becomes deeply problematic. So when we ask students to open up and to see things from a new light, when we ask them to challenge their sacred cows, if we don't give them a new framework in which to make sense of the world, Others are often there to do it for us, and it doesn't always end the way we hope it will. For the last year, I've been struggling with what media literacy is. I have a deep uh, level of respect for the primary goal. As Renee Hobbs has written, media literacy is the active inquiry and critical thinking about the messages we receive and create. The field talks about the development of competencies or skills to help people analyze, evaluate, and even create media. Media literacy is imagined to be empowering, enabling individuals to have agency and giving them the tools to help create a democratic society. But fundamentally, it's a form of critical thinking that asks people to doubt what they see. And right now, that makes me very nervous. Now, most media literacy proponents tell me that media literacy doesn't exist in school. And it's true that the ideal version that they're imagining and talking about most definitely does not. But I've spent a decade in and out of schools in this country where I've quickly learned that there is a perverted version of media literacy fully underway. Students are asked to distinguish between CNN and Fox or to identify bias in a news story. When tech is involved, it typically comes in the form of, you should not trust Wikipedia, but Google, Google it, which is a terrifying thought. <laughs> we might collectively dismiss those practices as not media literacy, but students understand those activities to be media literacy. And many communities think that's what we're talking about when we say media literacy. I'm painfully aware of this right now because of how media literacy is currently being proposed as the solution to fake news. My colleagues Monica Bolger and Patrick Davison just released a report on media literacy in light of fake news, trying to deal with the, gra the gaps that are underway. And part of it is that we regularly hear from funders and journalists, social media companies, and elected officials that they want a media literacy solution. I don't know what they're imagining. I hope it's not the version that is CNN versus Fox. Yet when I drill in and ask funders or ask other people what they're imagining, they talk about the need to combat propaganda, to get students to ask where money is coming from, to ask who's writing stories for what purposes, to learn how to fact check. And when I push them further about what they mean by that, 
The examples that typically come up are decidedly liberal narratives. They raise concerns about the Mercers, or about Infowars, or about the Russians. They mock alternative facts and the public's under failure to understand what we're talking about in the public domain. Now, while I identify as a progressive, I'm concerned about how those people understand, um, or how people in general understand different conservative phenomenon. And I'm really concerned about what they see media literacy as solving in this domain. I get that many progressive communities are panicked about conservative media. We live in a polarized society, and I worried about how people are judging each other um, based on not understanding or respecting where each other comes from. It seems to me that the narrow version of media literacy that I keep hearing is the solution is supposed to magically solve our political divide in this country. I can promise you it won't. More importantly, as I'm watching social media and news media get weaponized, I'm concerned that the well-intended interventions that I keep hearing people propose will backfire. Because I'm fairly certain that many of the forms of critical thinking that we've introduced into American education are backfiring right now. My talk today is really intended to interrogate some of the foundations upon which educating people about media depends. And I'm not going to come at this from an idealized perspective of what it should do or what would work, how it would work in a perfect condition. I want to talk about what's happening on the ground and how these things are getting perverted in really critical ways. I want to examine the instability of our current media ecosystem in order to come back to that question of what version of media literacy should be working towards. So let's begin. In 2017, sociologist Francesca Tapodi was trying to understand how conservative communities were making sense of what she thought were contradictory narratives within the president's speeches. And she wanted to understand how especially evangelical communities who really abhorred many of the values that seemed to be core to the president uh, were making sense and appreciating his words. So she started to attend Bible studies. And she realized that people were talking about the president's speeches as the word. She recognized that frame. And she realized that what they were doing was interpreting the speeches of the president and other political leaders in the same way that they were approaching any biblical text. It wasn't actually trying to make sense of things literally. Metaphors and constructs matter a lot more than the precision of language. So why do we value precision in language? I sat down for breakfast with Jillian Tett, a Financial Times reporter and anthropologist. She told me that when she first moved to the US from the, from the UK, she was really confounded about our ability to talk about class. She was trying to make sense of how we understood class in this country. And she realized it wasn't really about race or education, although those things obviously came up. But it seemed to be about what the appropriate construction of language and who was respected and valued by whom. And what she realized is that people became elite in this country by mastering the language marked as elite. Academics, journalists, corporate executives, traditional politicians, they all mastered the art of communication. This resonated to me. I'll never forget returning from my first semester in college and trying to talk to my high school classmates. And they asked me why I'd become so elite. And they were referring to my language. More importantly, although it's taboo in America to talk explicitly, about, explicitly condescendingly towards people based on the basis of race or education, there is no social cost in mocking someone because of their inability to master language or the way in which their language may signal certain codes for using terms like shithole. Linguistic and communication skills are not universally valued. Those who do not, not define themselves through this skill loathe hearing the never parading uh, energy of uh, rich and powerful people, suggesting that they're stupid, backwards, or otherwise lesser. Embracing becoming anti-politically correct has become a source of pride, a tactic of resistance. Anger boils over as people who reject what they see as the establishment are happy to watch who they see as elites quiver over their institutions being dismantled. We are in a culture war. Everyone believes that they are part of the resistance. So what is this culture war? Cory Doctorow got me thinking when he wrote the following. We're not living through a crisis about what is true. We're living through a crisis about how we know whether something is true. We're not disagreeing about facts. We're disagreeing about epistemology.
The establishment version of epistemology is, we use evidence to arrive at the truth vetted by independent verification, but trust us when we tell you that it's all been independently verified by people who are properly skeptical and not the bosom buddies of the people they were supposed to be fact checking. The alternative facts epistemological method goes like this. The so-called independent experts who were supposed to be verifying the so-called evidence-based truth were actually in bed with the people they were supposed to be fact-checking. In the end, it's all a matter of faith then. You either have faith that their experts are being truthful, or you have faith that we are. Ask your gut. What version feels more truthful? Let's be honest. Most of us educators are deeply committed to a way of knowing that is rooted in a version of evidence, reason, and fact. But who gets to decide what constitutes a fact? In our minds, we do. In philosophical circles, social constructivists challenge basic tenets like fact, truth, reason, and evidence. But it doesn't take a doctorate in philosophy to challenge the dominant way of constructing knowledge. Just remember, 75 years ago, evidence suggesting that blacks were biologically inferior was regularly used to justify discrimination, and that was called science. In many native communities, experience trumps science, or at least Western science as the way of knowledge. These communities have a different way of understanding topics like weather or climate or medicine. Experience is also used in activist circles as a way of seeking truth and challenging the status quo. Experience-based epistemologies often rely on evidence, but not the kind of evidence that would be recognized in scientific communities. Those whose worldview is rooted in religious faith, particularly Abrahamic religions, draw on different types of information to construct knowledge. Resolving scientific knowledge and faith-based knowledge has never been easy. This tension has countless political and social ramifications and has throughout the history of this country. As a result, American society has long danced around this yawning gulf and tried to find solutions that can appease everyone. But you cannot resolve fundamental epistemological differences through compromise. No matter what worldview or way of knowing that someone holds dear, they always believe that they are engaging in critical thinking when they're developing a sense of what is right and wrong, true and false, honest and deceptive. But much of what they conclude may be rooted in the way of knowing more than any specific source of information. That's true for all of us. If we're not careful, media literacy and critical thinking will simply be deployed in the classroom as an assertion of authority over epistemology. Right now, the conversation about fact-checking um, has already devolved to suggest that there is only one truth. And we have to recognize that there are plenty of students who are taught that there's only one legitimate way of knowing, one accepted worldview. This is particularly dicey at the collegiate level, where us professors have been taught nothing about how to teach, let alone how to teach across epistemologies. Personally, it took me a long time to recognize the limits of my own teachers. Like many Americans in less than ideal classrooms, I was taught that history was a set of facts to be memorized. When I questioned those facts, I was sent to the principal's office uh, for disruption uh, over and over again. Frustrated and confused, I came to the conclusion that I was being force-fed information for someone else's agenda, and my whole responsibility was to figure out whose agenda was at play. Now, with a little bit of age, I can recognize that the teacher was simply exhausted, underpaid, and waiting for retirement. <laughs> but it took me a long time to realize that there was value in history, to realize how history could be a tool for power and weaponized in different ways. And I'd like to think that our classrooms are an idyllic setting, we have to recognize that for many students, including myself, including many of you, they haven't always worked out the way that even our teachers hoped. Second section. The political scientist Dean Freelon was trying to make sense of the role of critical thinking to address fake news. He ended up looking back at a fascinating campaign run by Russia Today, known as RT. Their motto is question more. They produced a series of advertisements as teasers for their channel. These advertisements were promptly banned in the UK, resulting in RT putting up additional ads about how they were banned and getting tre tremendous media coverage, mainstream media coverage, about being banned. So what was so controversial about their ads? Here's an example. Just how reliable is the evidence that suggests human activity impacts on climate change? The answer isn't always clear cut. And it's only possible to make balanced judgment if you are better informed. By challenging the accepted view, we reveal a side of the news that you wouldn't normally see. Because we believe that the more you question, the more you know. 
if you don't start from a place where you're confident that climate change is real, this line of argument sounds reasonable. Why wouldn't you want more information? Why shouldn't you be engaged in critical thinking? Isn't this what you're supposed to be doing at school? So why is asking these questions taboo? It's a really interesting moment where people trying to make sense of these things don't understand the broader political landscape. Now, lest you think that this is just a moment of appeasing to climate deniers, let me give you one of their other ads. Is terror only committed by the terrorists? By terrorists? The answer isn't always clear cut. It's only possible to make a balanced judgment if you are better informed. By challenging the accepted view, we reveal a side of the news you wouldn't normally see because we believe the more you question, the more you know. You'll see the refrain there. Many progressive activists that I know ask this question often. What was amazing about the RT ads is that they appealed to everyone of every political stripe. And what was amazing is that because they were brought down as being too political, they got themselves an effective ad campaign. Because the media covered it as being banned, major news media effectively uh, legitimized their frame as a challenge of censorship to free speech, under the assumption that everyone should have the right to know and decide for themselves. This is how problematic narratives start to enter into the public fore. We live in a world right now where we equate free speech with the right to be amplified. Does everyone have the right to be amplified? Social media gave us that infrastructure under the false imagination that if we were all gathered in one place, we'd find common ground and eliminate conflict. We've, we've heard this before. After World War II, a lot of folks thought that if we actually made ourselves financially interdependent around the globe, that we would actually solve the possibility of there being a World War III. Mm, we might have seen this work out for a while, but I'm not sure how long this will logical hold or whether or not we can pay and affor or afford to pay the unintended consequences of it. For better or worse, connecting the world through social media and allowing anyone to be amplified, information can spread at record speed. There's no curation or editorial control. The onus is on the public to decide what they see. And since we live in a neoliberal society, that prioritizes individual agency, which is why we keep nubbling down on the narrative of media literacy as the solution to misinformation. Because it's up to each of us as individuals to decide for ourselves whether or not what we're getting is true. We are expected to self-investigate and figure it out. Well, if you talk with, uh, um, with someone who has posted clear, unquestionable misinformation, more often than not, they know it's complete bullshit. Or they don't care whether or not it's true, because that's not the point. They're posting content to make a statement. The people who posted this meme didn't bother to fact check this claim. They didn't care. What they wanted to signal loud and clear to their peers is that they hated Hillary Clinton. And that message is pretty clear. As a result, they're offended when you tell them that they've been duped by Russian propagandists or that they don't know what they're doing and they're making somebody money. They don't believe you for one second and they are offended that you are challenging their ability to construct information. Fundamentally, misinformation is contextual. Most people believe that they know what they are doing. They can tell, the, separate the wheat from the chaff. It's other people who are gullible. <laughs> that holds for everyone, by the way. I love talking to journalists who are like, we know what's true, and I'm like, really? To make matters worse, everyone thinks that we can find a way to fact check or moderate our way out of this at some scaled level, and that we can discern for people what they should or shouldn't know. It sounds a lot like censorship in different forms. But don't worry, no matter what, even if it isn't, it'll fail because that's not actually what's at stake. For many people in this country, we need to recognize that both media and education are viewed as the enemy. Two institutions that are trying to have power over how people think. Two institutions that are believed to be asserting authority over epistemology. All right, let's go down a little further. Growing up on Usenet, Godwin's Law was more than an adage to me. I spent countless nights on the internet um, determined to have conversation because someone was wrong on the internet, right? And I long ago lost count about how many of them ended with someone invoking Hitler or the Holocaust, and sometimes it was me. So fast forward 15 years to the point when Nathan Poe wrote a poignant comment on the online forum dedicated to Christianity. Without a winking smile, or other blatant display of humor, it is utterly impossible to parody a creationist in a way that someone won't mistake for the genuine article. Poe's law, as it became known, signals that it's hard to tell the difference between an extreme view and a parody of an extreme view on the internet. In their book, The Ambivalent Internet, 
Media studies scholars uh, Whitney Phillips and Ryan Milner highlight how a segment of society, many of them young people, have become so well versed at digital communications, leveraging memes, GIFs, videos, etc., that they use these tools of expression not just to tell their story, but to fundamentally destabilize others' communication structures and worldviews. It's hard to tell what is real and what is fiction, what's cruel and what's a joke, but that's the point. That's how irony and ambiguity have become weaponized. And for some, the goal is actually pretty clear. Dismantle the very foundations of elite epistemological structures that are so deeply rooted in fact and evidence. For others, it's more simply about the lulls. Many people, especially young people, turn to online communities to make sense of the world around them. They want to ask uncomfortable questions, interrogate assumptions, and poke holes at things they've heard. <laughs> Welcome to youth culture. Um, but there are some questions that we have already told them are unacceptable to ask in public. They've learned that, but that hasn't stopped them from asking it. They've turned to various online fora where no question or intellectual explanation um, is seen as unacceptable. In these environments, to restrict the freedom of thought is to censor. And so all sorts of communities have popped up to invite people to ask hard questions. And some of those communities have popped up to encourage people to go down certain paths of thinking, some of those paths being deeply extreme, others just being a slippery mess where it's really hard to tell what is real and what is not. And that's why you have to ask yourself when you're looking at these fora, are people taking on hateful views? Are they real? Are they being ironic? What's really going on? It's the hardest thing to make sense of. <laughs> In the 1999 film, The Matrix, Morpheus says to Neo, you take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Most youth aren't interested in having the wool pulled over their head, even if blind faith may be calming. So restricted in mobility and stressed to holy hell, they want to have access to what's inaccessible, know what's taboo, and say what's politically correct. They can't do it in a lot of their face-to-face -face environments, so they turn online. Who wouldn't want to take the red pill? Of course, in many of these online communities, the red pill refers to the idea of waking up to how education and media are stacked against them to deceive people into taking on uh, a progressive propaganda narrative. In these environments, visitors are asked to question more. They're asked to self-investigate. They're invited to rid themselves of their politically correct shackles. There's an entire online university des designed to undo accepted ideas about diversity, climate, and history. I've seen some of the best classes in communication targeted at teaching people how to manipulate and leverage propaganda. Some of these communities are just doing it as a moment of empowerment. Others have a particularly extreme worldview and mode. These are all meant to fill in gaps for those who are open to questioning what they've been taught, those who are in a moment of doubt, those who are looking for answers after they've been encouraged to dismantle the perspectives that they've already had. So let's talk about an extreme version of this. In 2012, it was hard not to avoid the names Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, but that didn't mean most people in this country actually understood the storyline. In South Carolina, a white teenager who wasn't interested in the news felt like he needed to know what the whole fuss was about. He decided to go to Wikipedia to understand more. He was left with the impression that Zimmerman was clearly in the right and disgusted that everyone was defending Martin. While reading up on the case, he ran across the term black on white crime in Wikipedia. And he decided to throw that term into Google, where he encountered a deeply racist website inviting him to wake up to a reality that he had never considered. He spent multiple years reading all sorts of online environments, shifting his worldview extremely. And on June 17th, 2015, he sat down for an hour with a group of African-American churchgoers in Charleston, South Carolina, before opening fire on them, killing nine and injuring one. He made very clear what his goal was. He wanted to start a race war. It's easy to say that this domestic terrorist was insane or irrational, but let's acknowledge that he began by trying to critically interrogate the media coverage of a, a common story that he didn't understand. Because he couldn't understand what the fuss is about using the traditional media channels, he started to go into other online fora, where people who were spending decades indoctrinating people into deeply troubling racist views were more than happy to have conversations with him. 
In these environments, they drew on countless forms of evidence, engage in deeply persuasive, discursive practices, and they have the mechanisms to challenge countless assumptions because they've heard it all before. The difference between what is deemed missionary work, education, and radicalization depends a lot on your worldview and your understanding of power. The majority of Americans do not trust the news media. There are many explanations for this. Loss of local news, financial incentives, hard to distinguish between opinion and reporting, etc. But what does it mean to encourage people to be critical of media's narratives when they are already predisposed against the news media, when they are already wary of it? Perhaps we start from a place of wanting to encourage people to think critically about how information is constructed, who is paying for it, and what is being left out. These are narratives that are weaponized online all the time. Because for those whose prior is not to trust the news media, among those who see CNN and New York Times as fake news, they're already asking those questions. And they hear those questions not in the way that you intend them. They've been looking for flaws, and it's not hard to find them. After all, the news industry is made of people, in institutions, in a society. But when they are encouraged to just be critical of the news, they come away thinking that the media is lying. And more and more, I see these young people talking in online fora about how they've been encouraged in the classroom to question media, and that led them into these environments. Depending on someone's prior, what they may take away is proof that the media is in on the conspiracy. <laughs> of course, that's where things start to get really, really dicey. So many of my colleagues have been uh, encouraging people to make media in order to understand how information is produced. Well, I track the people who have learned how to make media. Young people have learned these skills outside of the classroom. We not, may not always appreciate it, or it may not be in the form we want, but they are learning it in order to you know, spread a meme or gain followers on YouTube. Many are quite skilled at using media, but to what end? Every day I watch teenagers produce anti-Semitic and misogynistic content using the same tools that activists use to combat prejudice. It's notable that almost everyone I'm watching espousing extreme uh, views on the internet have extraordinary skills using media, far greater skills than most of my peers. Today's neo-Nazis are not simply marching in our streets. They're becoming a digital propaganda machine, and they're growing over time. Developing media-making skills does not guarantee that someone will use them for good, or that someone can use them to combat the cultural dynamics that we're seeing unfold. Most of my peers think that if more people are skilled and more people are asking hard questions, somehow goodness will see the light. It will surface up. It will be what everybody pays attention to. And it's funny, I was talking about misunderstandings of the First Amendment with uh, Nabiya Saeed of BuzzFeed. And she argues that you know, the frame of the marketplace of ideas is a long-standing one, both in technology and broader society. Because it sounds like you know, we just have to work out what the quality content is, and it will work itself out in the public. Because we believe in the market, and we believe in individuals. Well, doubling down on investing in individuals as a solution to systematic abuse of power is a very American but very ineffective approach. The best ideas do not always surface to the top. And one of the reasons that I'm nervous right now, and I'm here, is because I've been spending the last couple of years tracking those who are manipulating the media um, to use adversarial messages, become far stronger, far more capable, and their messages are increasingly coming to the top. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not to say we shouldn't try to educate people or that producing critical thinking is inherently a bad thing. I don't want a world of sheeple, but I also don't want to naively assume that media literacy can solve our cultural war, that media literacy or any media critique is enough to actually deal with what's going on. I want us to understand that teaching someone these skills may backfire, that l recognizing that people are using these skills when they don't trust you, they may use it in a way that you can't imagine. It's one thing to talk about interrogating assumptions when a person has an emotional distance from the um, object of study. It's entirely different to deal with issues when the very asked, act of asking questions is what's being weaponized. We're not dealing with historical propaganda distributed through mass media, or an exercise in state power, as much as we'd like to think that it is. This is about making sense of an information landscape where the very tools that people use to make sense of the world around them have been strategically perverted by people who believe themselves to be resisting the same powerful actors that often we think we should be able to critique. Look at this graph. Can you guess what the search term is? 
This is crisis actors. It's the making of a conspiracy. It's the concept of emerged originally in online fora after Sandy Hook. The online communities worked really hard every time a different um, horrible mass murder occurred to get the media to discuss the people that were being on film as crisis actors. With Parkland, they finally succeeded. Every media outlet is now asking you, is there a crisis actor problem? Are there actually crisis actors? Should you think of crisis actors? Crisis actors is a conspiracy. It's an obsession. Every single one of those young teenagers who goes on to TV has to defend themselves that they are not a crisis actor. That is a conspiracy message that has been used strategically to undermine their message from the get-go. It's been targeting at mainstream media. And because people hear this term, they turn to Google and Bing to ask what the crisis actor is. And this is the challenge. Because for most of you, it's just like, oh, this is just a frustrating moment of media. You get to the Snopes page and you're like, yeah, it's a total conspiracy. But the point is to actually invite just a few more people down that rabbit hole. Because after you read the Snopes, uh, Snopes description, you're basically being asked to not think of an elephant. You may dismiss it as craziness, but getting this media narrative is meant to get people to look further. Some people will keep researching, trying to understand what the fuss is all about. They'll find online fora discussing images of a brunette woman and ask themselves, is this maybe the same person? Just stare at the image for a little while. They'll try to figure out what the fight between David Hogg and InfoWars is all about, or why it was that InfoWars was being restricted by YouTube. They may think this is censorship. Seeds of doubt will start to form. And they'll find themselves asking whether or not the articulate people on TV might actually be crisis actors, and then they'll tell themselves it couldn't be. But that seed of doubt is where things get po powerfully weaponized. And for some people, it puts them into a deeper place to go further. One of the main goals for those seeking to manipulate media or dismantle our institutions is to pervert the public's thinking. It's called gaslighting. Do you trust what is real? One of the best ways to gaslight the public is to troll the media by getting the news media to be forced into negating a frame. They can rely on the fact that people who distrust the media often respond by self-investigate. This is the power of the boomerang effect, and it has a history. These communities I tracked two years ago talked about making sense of the CDC report, uh, where they realized that, um, that every time the news media negated a correlation between autism and vaccination, the more Americans believed there to be a correlation. They thought that they would try to try this out. Could they do it themselves? So in 2016, I watched networks of online participants test this theory through an incident now known as Pizzagate. They worked hard to get the media to negate the conspiracy theory. The role wasn't because they wanted them to you know, confirm it, they wanted them to negate it. Because they believed it would prompt more people to re research it if something was there. They were effective. The news media started to negate it. Hundreds of people showed up in the shop in DC. One showed up with a gun. The term gaslighting originates in the context of domestic violence. The term refers back to a 1944 movie called Gaslight, where a woman is manipulated by her husband in a way that leaves her thinking she's crazy. It's a very effective technique of control. It makes someone submissive and disoriented, unable to respond to a relationship productively. Now, when many anti-domestic violence activists argue that the first step to, is to understand you're being gaslighted, um, the real answer is not to fight back against the person who is doing the gaslighting. It's to get out. Anti-domestic violence experts realize that recovery from gaslighting is a long and arduous process, taking a lot of therapy and a lot of focused energy. Because once doubt is instilled, self-doubt is really hard to overcome. We have many problems in our media landscape, but the most dangerous is how it's being weaponized to gaslight people, to make them feel like they can't tell what reality is, to constantly engage in a seed of doubt so that they're not sure. And that is the power both in these online environments and from a variety of foreign actors. But unlike the domestic violence context, there is no getting out that's really possible right now. We can talk about going off the grid or opting out of social media, turning off the news, but come on, let's be honest. In 2017, Netflix released a show called 13 Reasons Why. Before parents and educators had even heard the darn show, uh, millions of teenagers had started watching it. For most viewers, it was a fascinating show. The storyline was enticing, the acting was phenomenal. But I'm on the board of Crisis Text Line, an amazing service where people across this country uh, talk with trained counselors via, crisis, or via text message when they're in crisis. Before the news media even began reporting about the show, 
we started to see the spike. After all, the premise of the show is that a teen girl died by suicide and left behind 13 tapes explaining how being bullied had allowed her to justify this decision. At Crisis Text Line, we do active rescues every night. This means that we send emergency personnel to the home of someone who is in the middle of an active suicide attempt in an effort to save their lives. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. It's really heartbreaking work. As word of 13 Reasons Why got out and people started watching the show, our numbers went through the roof. We were drowning in young people, referencing the show, signaling how it had given them a framework for ending their lives. We panicked, all hands on deck. As we got things under control, I got angry. What the heck was Netflix thinking? Researchers know the data on suicide in media. The more the media normalizes suicide, the more suicide is put into heads as a possibility, a thing to consider. And those who are triggerable start to actually take it seriously and to put it as a framework in their own heads for themselves. Early media effects research was published. Um, journalists develop best practices to minimize their coverage of suicide. As Joan Donovan talks about, this form of strategic silence was uh, viable in earlier media landscapes, but it's a lot harder now. But because things are covered on the internet, mainstream media, TV producers all feel that they have a right to cover what we understood historically as taboo topics. They feel that they have the right to amplify it because someone on the internet might do it for them. We know you can't combat depression through rational discourse. Addressing depression is hard work. I'm concerned that at the same way, we don't have the foggiest clue how to approach what's going on in the media landscape today. I'm confident that giving grounded people tools to think smarter can be effective. I hope that this is the majority of your students. But I am not convinced that we know how to educate people who do not share our epistemological frame. I'm not convinced that we know how to undo gaslighting. I'm not convinced that we understand how people uh, deal with media and how that media intersects with those who are struggling with mental health issues. And I'm not convinced that we've even begun to think about the unintended consequences of our good and naive interventions. In other words, I think there's a lot of assumptions baked into how we approach educating people about sensitive issues. And our current media crisis has made some of those painfully visible. Oh, and by the way, Netflix ended that first season by setting up season two to start with a school shooting. WTF? So what role do educators play in grappling with the um, contemporary media landscape? What kind of media literacy makes sense in this context? I'm gonna be honest, I don't know. I've been staring down this you know, work for two years trying to make sense of what we do to intervene, and I am lost. And I know that I, at the same time, I just came and scared the heck out of you, and it's really unfair to end a talk like this without offering some path forward, so I'm gonna try, because <laughs> that's only fair and because I want you to have a better rest of your day. Um, I believe at the end of the day we need to figure out how to develop antibodies uh, to help people not be deceived. And that's really tricky, and when I talk to cognitive scientists, they're really struggling with what that means because people like to follow their gut more than they like to follow their mind, and that makes our education mantle really difficult. No one wants to hear that they're being tricked. So I think there might be some valuable in trying to help people at least understand their own psychology. I say this having completely failed because I've spent the last couple of years trying to explain to journalists how they're being gamed by these different actors. And they keep telling me, they'll, no, they're not, until they get publicly shamed for reposting foreign tweets or having been tricked into um, covering uh, a shooter as a white nationalist. Now, let's think about some of the ways in which this works out. Consider the power of nightly news and talk radio. If you bring Sean Hannity, Rachel Maddow, or any other host into your home every night, you start to appreciate how they think. You may not agree with them, but you build a cognitive model of words such that they have a coherent logic to them. This is the power of this role. They become real to you, even if they don't know who you are. This is what scholars talk about as parasocial interactions. In fact, it's exactly how we think about helping people deal with folks that are different than them, is to really make them real. Your crazy uncle, make them real by putting them in your face. And that's one of the challenges, because we invest our energies into trying to understand those people. And that's actually pretty powerful in trying to get across difference when you recognize that's what you're doing. But of course, empathy is a powerful emotion, one that we generally want to encourage. But it also is one that can be tricked, because when you start to empathize with worldviews that are toxic, it is actually really hard to stay grounded. It requires deep cognitive strength. 
as a researcher who spends a lot of time looking at really toxic materials, I draw on the best practices from a lot of people who study this work. And what we learn is that you ha in order to keep emotional distance, you have to build a set of tools in place. And one very basic tactic is to actually separate out the different signals. Read the text rather than consuming the multimedia presentation. Narrow the scope. Actively taking things out of context can be helpful for analysis precisely because it creates a cognitive disconnect. It's how you can read somebody who you disagree with presidential speeches. It's also how you can read someone who you disagree with toxic material online is to try to keep a version of distance. Of course, the trick here is to know that that's what you're doing and to realize that that's part of the game, but mostly we tend to people to read all the context, to make sense of all the things. And people aren't really looking to interrogate things and to interrogate their own psychology. So it's a question of whether or not we're looking at the media itself or we're looking at our own response to that media. I believe that you actually have to help young people, students, really appreciate epistemological differences. In other words, why do people from different worldviews interpret the same piece of information differently? So we often tend to talk about the intention behind the production, but I would argue we have to analyze the difference and contradictions in possible interpretation. This requires uh, developing a strong, strong sense of where other people think from and understand the perspectives of where they lie. From an educational point of view, it really is trying to find a way to firmly hold on to your worldview while being able to embrace somebody else's. This is, in many ways, the practice of an ethnographer. This is what I have to do professionally all the time. It is also something that we already see in our educational environments through things like debate team, right? an effort at trying to really hold on to coherently someone else's perspective. Now, of course, appreciating the view of someone who is deeply toxic isn't the most psychologically stabilizing. So there's an interesting question of how far that can go. I also am really fascinated about how young people, or any of us actually, I should say, filling gaps when information is presented to us is sparse, um, and how we have to deal with overcoming priors. We're having a lot of conversations about confirmation bias these days, uh, because it's important to understand um, what information we accept and reject. And another one is selective attention. Um, this is most famously done through the gorilla experiment. If you haven't seen this, it's a pretty phenomenal one. The basic idea is to show students a basketball video and have them focus on counting passes made between people in one color shirt and then asking if they saw the gorilla. Most people don't, actually. Um, and then, of course, having to then see it, they're like, why didn't I see it? So, Another way of thinking about it is something that we actually have seen from the digital media and learning ecosystem. Because if you invert gaps in stories, you actually can start to see, or sorry, if you invest in understanding gaps in stories, you actually fill them in. And so this is my favorite thing about fan fiction. Fan fiction is actually where we have holes in stories, so we fill in the gaps. But understanding that that's what you're doing is actually part of the process, that your mind does this all the time, that if you're given just coarse information, you will flesh it out as something that's really important. Now, what's common about these different approaches that I'm offering is that they're designed to be cognitive strengthening exercises, to help students recognize their own fault lines, not the fault lines of the media landscape, not the fault lines of the things in front of them. And I can imagine that this too could be re referred to as media literacy, and if you want to bend your definition that way, I'll accept it. But the key is to really put the humanity in ourselves and in others. We cannot and should not get in the game of ather asserting authority over epistemology. That will get us into trouble. We need to make certain our students are more aware of how interpretation is socially constructed. Do not actually assume that the answer is to find the facts, to fact check, to look things up as a formal idea of research. We need them to understand how even a simple fact can be manipulated for a variety of different purposes. And of course, I should say this, just because you know you're being manipulated doesn't mean you can resist it. And grappling with that is also in itself really hard, which is honestly where my proposal gets super shaky. Let's be honest, our information landscape is going to be more and more complex. I do believe educators have a critical role to play in helping students and societies generally navigate what we encounter. But the path forward is not going to allow us to double down on what constitutes a fact or teaching people to assess sources. Rebuilding trust in institutions and information and intermediaries is important, but we need to recognize from the get-go that people do not trust them and so asking people to rely on those as signals will not work. The first wave of media literacy, the work that we saw coming out of Europe, was really responding to propaganda in a mass media context. We live in a networked world now. You of all people know that. That's why you're here. 
but we need to understand how those networks are intertwined and how information is spreading through those dyadic and asymmetric encounters, how they're understood and experienced differently than what is produced and disseminated through mass media. Because that transition is really shaping how people are making sense of things, and our typical tools to allow them to interrogate aren't working. Above all, we need to recognize that information can and will be weaponized in new ways. And we are in a moment right now where people are learning new tricks on a regular basis about how to weaponize information. This isn't simply about Madison Avenue or Edward Benet's style um, state campaigns. We can argue that they still exist. But what has been really challenging for me is that for the last 15 years, I've watched a cohort of young people learn how to hack the attention economy. They did it because they saw it having power. They saw social media as their playground. It was a place for you know, information sharing amongst their peers. It was a place for hanging out. It was a place to geek out. It was a phenomenal place. But for some number of them, those who were really struggling with who they were, their identities, and trying to make sense of the world around them, those who we would normally think of as the most vulnerable youth, not because they are vulnerable in a traditional sense, but because they are lost themselves. Those are the young people who have figured out how to use this to regain power. They want to have power in this environment. And they find that power not in disrupting your classroom, but in disrupting the entire information landscape by gaslighting people because it gives them a sense of control. It makes them laugh to see other people fall into their traps. They are not the majority, but they are in each and every one of your classrooms. And a lot of it has to do with how frustrated they are by the environment around them, how, about, how destabilized they are. I think we need to start paying attention to them, and we need to start figuring out what our networked response is to this networked landscape. Because the solution to this, above all else, will require us to deal with the instability that we have in this country. The instability that's not just in our media landscape, that's in every aspect and in every community. Because until we start grappling that with this, I don't see a way out. Thank you. I didn't wear my glasses, so I'm going to come close to your questions. Um, if, cri if critical thinking and individual agency can be co-opted, what sort of thinking and agency are needed? Something beyond Western thinking and cognito. I agree. Um, I don't think our Western structure is working. I think one of the biggest challenges is that I don't know how to get American society in particular away from this all being about individuals. We are dealing with a systemic level challenge. A systemic level challenge of people trying to make sense of these things. And it's going to require a systemic level solution. But almost always our solutions are about like figuring out ways in which people are individually empowered. One of the biggest challenges that definitely comes from more Eastern thought is that the individual is always not just in the context, but they're always responding to it. It is part of a flow. How we get that into the broader mindset of an American society that doesn't actually relate to that as experience, I don't know. Because this is all about, like, it's just about us. We have control. We have power. And that's affecting every part of our ecosystem right now. So I sort of look through this, and I'm just like, OK, how do we get people to embrace this? And how do we also figure out how to protect people as networks? The other thing I would invite to you is that we actually need to build and support sustained networks of people. So I'm often asked, like, what do I teach somebody about like, how to resist power in a company or how to you know, challenge what's ethical? Is make certain that that person has a grounded network of people around them and realize that the fight can often not come from within. It's also true around a lot of what we're dealing with. We have systematically dismantled a lot of the social networks that allow diversity to actually hold together in this country. It's one of the reasons why we're especially polarized, because we don't know people who aren't like us. Um, and not only that, we don't know these systems. So if we want to talk about one of the reasons I believe that the media landscape is a mess, it used to be that everyone in your community knew somebody who was a journalist or knew somebody who knew somebody who was a journalist. In most communities in this country, that's not true. And it's especially not true when you're asking if you know somebody who works in Silicon Valley. Most people are further removed. And so you distrust systems that are further removed. That's one of the reasons our founding fathers knew that representatives had to be locally in their communities. And one of the biggest challenges we've had is we've grown as a country. So one of the things I'd say, you know, as you're trying to think through this, 
one of the things is not just about those non-Western thoughts, but also about how do you stitch together networks where you can trust and respect somebody across different and a sustained way. So many people believe that we need to normalize topics like mental illness. How do we do this if we need to tr uh, avoid triggers and not talk about taboo topics? If we don't figure out how to support people in a mental Ill who are struggling with mental illness, I don't know how anything else can work about it. And I think this is the th reason why you know, we often want to normalize it in the hopes that this will actually allow us to have support structures for mental illness. We have no support structures for mental illness in this country. I will say this, as someone who sits behind Crisis Text Line, even the ability to get what we're doing funded is phenomenally frustrating. And we are spending hours upon hours every night talking to people who are really struggling. And one of the worst parts about it is when you're sitting there and you're like, you need long-term care and we have no one, nowhere to take it, nowhere to go with it. So we do need to figure out how we can talk about mental illness, but we more than anything need to figure out how we can support it. And until we figure out how we can support those who are struggling, support the families that are struggling, this is the challenge with a very, our very structure of our country, which is that we believe that everybody should be on their own. And this goes back to the same sort of challenge, because what really helps someone deal with mental illness is the care and support of a variety of people around them. Trained professionals, family, of course, medicine and doctors, different kinds of Eastern healing. There's a whole variety of things that can work together. But if we just rely on it for somebody to figure it out themselves, we're not going to be able to do it. Do you think that Google, Reddit banning hate articles like Infowars is against freedom of speech? They are private companies. Should they take responsibility or no? I spend a lot of time these days with the tech industry. In fact, one of the reasons why it's so weird to be in Austin is I've sat in so many rooms or in so many hallways, let's be honest, in this building, talking to people about different kinds of products, imagining what we could do if we just built it this way. I can tell you that none of the executives at any of these companies had any idea that it would go in this direction. And they're all struggling in different ways. What is freedom of speech? What was the point of freedom of speech? The idea of freedom of speech is that anybody has the right to speak, to communicate, to basically challenge the political structures of the day. We've built a set of laws saying that there are limitations to that speech. There are limitations when it is hateful. There are limitations when the speech itself does harm, when the speech is a threat to the president. There's a variety of places where we've carved it out. But the reason that we protect speech or expression as a society, as an American society, is because we want people to be able to challenge the political structures. That doesn't mean that everybody has to hear what you say. That doesn't mean that everybody has the right to be amplified. And there's some very interesting tensions about where the limits of that are. And one of the challenges is we started to work those out in a variety of different ways in other media. We have not worked those out in social media um, or in search engines or in any other information landscape. And so one of the challenges that these companies are doing is they're trying different things, not just on the American uh, rubric of the First Amendment, on, but under a belief that free expression is a good thing. Because even when they're not situated within an American legal frame, they're very much situated as private companies believing that free expression is a good thing. But even they are rub running up against the edges of that. And it's really tricky. Because depending on who you're trying to move, you're trying to shift different things. So for example, one of the things that we know from um, anti-terrorism work is that one of the best things as someone's coming down the funnel is to take that top layer and redirect them. Right, to send them off in a different direction. Ooh, look, there are cute cats over here. Right? And it's amazingly effective to do this, and that deals with this environment. We also know that when people are at the bottom end, when they are searching for specific sermons that are not easily found on the internet, we know that they're already deeply involved in an environment that is actually already pretty darn toxic. The question is always sort of where in the middle of the rabbit hole you're trying to deal with things. And so I challenge, I, I'm struggling, just like I struggled with the RT, where we blocked RT, and they're winning the media narrative by basically showing that they've been censored. Not for you. You haven't found that. You're not paying attention to RT. But for the people who are starting to go down that rabbit hole. And so the big question for me is, is like, how much are we performing blocking things? How much are we actually dealing with people who are at different levels? And the stark reality is, I don't think we know. And I think it's going to be a big challenge to figure out how we move across that, which is what I feel like we're you know, in the middle of. So 
how can we use technology to create live in-person communities? <laughs> you know, that's uh, whether we're talking about Meetup or we're, whether we're talking about different dynamics. You know, the funny thing about Twitter, I was here when uh, Twitter was first released um, in a functional form. The original structure of Twitter, like Dodgeball and Foursquare, was to connect people at South by Southwest. It was about people in person. It was saying, like, let's be able to talk across things. The reason the hashtag that you know started up was because people wanted to actually separate out different rooms in this building, right? The whole point was in person. And one of the things is, that, of course, it took off, and it took off in all sorts of different dimensions. And you know what? It quickly became un tenable um, in just a cell phone based version, right? And yet we stuck with 140 characters for a very long time. So one of the things that's sort of funny is that these things get designed for a very particular idea of what they could be used for, and then they twist in different ways. They go in different forms. Let's think about Facebook. Facebook was originally designed to help you get to know people on your college campus, right? It was about in person. So I think that it's more a matter of like, how do we deal with the fact that some people want to do things online and offline and then move between? The place where I really struggle with this, to be honest, is that we've spent so much time restricting our young uh, population in this country from spending face-to-face -face time together in an unstructured way that I don't know why we're surprised if they spend lots of time in online fora that are deeply concerning. Right? And so I would argue that the first path is very clear. Let young people have more freedom. Like, that's pretty simple to me. It's also tricky to me because I think that a lot of the recommendations of how we try to segment the online and offline into these formal structures end up backfiring. I, uh, I had to sign a form uh, for my son for school next year where I had to agree to the social media policy. I'm sure you are all going through this. It's sort of my favorite thing to do. Um, where they're like, and teachers shall never be allowed to communicate with your child in social media. And I'm sitting here going, why the heck not? Why? Because part of it is, is that we have not just removed young people from public spheres, we have mo removed them from inner age dynamics. We've mo removed them from an environment where they can be part of a broader ecosystem. That doesn't mean that I want your party pictures from tonight shared with your students, because I don't think that's a good idea. But the idea that you could have an open door online, just like you have an open door in your classroom, should be something that we take as a given. Because we need people to actually be part of broader societies. And what's challenged to me for those who I'm watching who are going through really toxic places is that they had been looking for online environments. They've been looking for somebody, a community, someone where they felt safe around that included in many ways adults, not for any sort of mischievous or horrible way, but they wanted someone to take them seriously, to engage them. My guess is that many of you are in this profession because you want to engage young people. You want to help them think. So why do we close these walls off at the moments when young people most need them? Why do we say we can't have conversations outside of the classroom unless it's done under a formal structure? Why can't we create an environment where adults that people trust are present online? Now that doesn't mean I say, suggest, I've never suggested you go out and stalking your students. I think this is a terrible idea. Don't go and friend them. But when they come to you, why don't we allow that? Why don't we allow people to actually be a part of broader society? And that's the funny thing to me about a lot of these environments. Some of that began, began in gaming. Right? And one of the things about gaming is, is that one of the only inner age environments that young people are actually encouraged or allowed to participate in. We have done a whole variety of things over 100 years in this country to age segregate. It is one of the cornerstones of our bullying challenge. It's one of our cornerstones of our social isolation problem. And it is one of our current problems in radicalization right now. My big invitation for you as you're thinking about it is within your communities, Figure out novel ways to stop age segregating, because that's one of the things that is going to be critical in going forward. And with that, I am to leave you, so thank you very much.